Good afternoon, everyone. We're, we're going to start the afternoon programming. Um, thank you again for showing up and participating in this year's conference. Obviously, a great turnout. We appreciate each and every one of you for being here. Uh, one of the questions we always get asked is, what's market for independent sponsored deals? And our next presentation is going to help answer that question on a variety of topics. Uh, Jeff Brooker and Greg Hover of two of our partners in the private equity practice do as many independent sponsor deals as anyone in the country. They've been analyzing all the data um, and are here to present some of the highlights from our deal survey. So Jeff and Greg, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Uh, thank you, John. Um, so we're, you know, as John said, we're excited to present this uh, deal study. It's been a lot of work over the course of the year, um, culling this into a presentation and we are working on uh, a published uh, paper as well that's going to uh, accompany this. Um, I'm Jeff Brooker. Uh, I'm a private equity partner here in Dallas. Uh, focused my work uh, primarily on uh, you know, private equity, middle market, uh, industry agnostic uh, transactions uh, with a pretty significant component of my practice uh, being independent sponsor deals uh, representing either the capital provider uh, or the independent sponsor. And then a lot of times the jointly capitalized uh, holding company that does the M&A deal uh, as part of that. Great, thanks. I'm Greg Hover. I'm a partner in our private equity group. I'm based out of Chicago. Uh, glad to be here today. Uh, similar to Jeff, I focus my time on private equity backed transactions uh, in the middle market to lower middle market. A uh, significant portion of my practice has an independent sponsor component to it, whether we represent the independent sponsor or the capital provider. Uh, I also have a uh, significant overlay of healthcare uh, on my practice. Maybe half or more of my deals have a healthcare component kind of consistent with some of the other strengths of the McGuire Woods private equity group. Um, in addition to you know, the work we put in on this survey, Jeff and I also host, uh, help co-host regional networks with respect to our independent sponsors in Boston with respect to Jeff, um, myself in Chicago and Florida. And we also have a podcast uh, with our partner, Rebecca Brophy, uh, it's called Deal by Deal that um, we, we have independent sponsors join us on that. And we talk about what's market uh, trends, et cetera, war stories. Uh, so that's available uh, any place you download your uh, podcast, including iTunes, check it out. Uh, cheap plug there. Uh, so anyways, about, about the survey, uh, a lot, you know, the McGuire Woods lawyers here put a lot of work into it, but also a lot of the people in this room put a lot of work into it as well. Uh, and so thank you for those of you that filled out a survey. Uh, general methodology, we had almost... Um, 300 respondents. We sent out a survey uh, with, a, with more than 50 questions analyzing the economic deal terms of independent sponsors deals. Uh, and those respondents included both McGuire Woods clients and deals that McGuire Woods worked on, but also deals that we didn't work on, um, which is important. And we'll touch upon that later. Uh, again, we had about 300 responses Deals surveyed covered 2018, 2019, and 2020, with the majority being in 2020. We feel quite confident that this is the largest data set of its kind. And, you know, together with the working group we had here at McGuire Woods, really does give a really good picture of what's market. And so, yeah, there's what I, we have a, what I'd like to refer to as a big honking spreadsheet that has all this data in it. And we nerd out by cutting it up in different interesting ways. So uh, we'll, we'll probably be doing that kind of over the course of the year as well. Jeff loves the slice data. That's, <laughs> that's his, his, new, his new hobby in addition to closing m and deals is slicing data uh, together with, with me. So great. Um, so that covers uh, the intro here. Uh, again, uh, the two of us and, and John uh, really love the charge on this. Uh, together with the help from, uh, you know, the, the data from everyone in this room. So, you know, more to, you know, an intro of the survey. 
uh, the, the sizes of the deals surveyed, yeah, I think you'll see that, you know, roughly, and, and look at this, I even have a laser pointer. Um, so roughly two thirds of the deals fall between 10 million and 50 million uh, in enterprise value, uh, which is consistent with, you know, sort of both the McGuire Woods practice in the middle market to lower middle market. But I think also the, the deals that independent sponsors are finding uh, we, we are seeing deal, you know, larger deals in the $100 million range, but, but again, the majority are in the $10 million to $50 million uh, range. Um, interestingly, so, so we don't have it pictured here, but if you think about the size of the equity checks, which is another component uh, when you think about the deal size, um, two thirds of our deals had between 5 million and 25 million as far as equity checks that were being written. Um, that doesn't include uh, any seller rollover component and that also backs out any debt finance. Uh, so that is, as we're going through what's market, that, that is the, the general band of, of the deals that we're looking at. Uh, some common industries here um, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the usual suspects may be skewing uh, a bit more to healthcare deals, just again, um, you know, based on the, the, the survey respondents or people in the McGuire Woods networks. And so uh, that heavy healthcare overlay, you, you see that. Uh, but there was a, there was a pretty wide dispersion of, of industries. This, so this is a, this is a really, you, the number of different industries was 15 or 20. It was in a pretty broad cross section. These were just some of the ones that, that popped up the most. Yep. Yep. Next slide. Yeah. Okay, great. So this is the, an interesting slide. Um, it's, it shows the, the multiple of adjusted EBITDA that the deal was priced at. Um, and so you, you'll see, you know, this is consistent we think with independent sponsors finding value and finding deal prices that in today's market are, you know, probably on the whole difficult to find, um, you know, two thirds of the deals were, were under a six X multiple. And then, you know, 80% or so were under a seven X multiple. Um, and that, if you think about it, makes, makes sense. It's the, you know, the independent sponsors finding value, finding an attractive deal at an attractive price, uh, and then the, the deals that actually close, I think there's a, there's a bias toward the, the price being such that it allows the independent sponsor to carve out his economics without carving too much into the, the capital providers. Because you know, if, the, if we're paying a full market price and then we have to take a, a heavy uh, economic package to the independent sponsor, that, you know, that deal can be hard to finance because a lot of the capital providers will say, you know, well, once you take, you know, once you've paid this, plus I've paid you, this is not as attractive to me. And so, you know, finding that, that uh, value deal is I think critical for, uh, for folks to get these, these deals funded. Okay, so th this next slide um, is just number and types of equity partners. And so, one of the one of the things that's interesting about it is it's, it's a very small number, only eight percent, that uh, is a true kind of pass the hat club deal. Um, it mostly what we're finding is the number of equity uh, providers in these deals it, is pretty small, um, and, and that so you know, two to four, uh, five to ten, uh, or one being you know almost all the deals, and uh, then the, the types of equity partners. You know, 41% is, is that, that kind of those middle three bars, which is kind of private equity of various flavors. Uh, and then 52% would be family offices and high net worth individuals. And we, we did lump those together. They were separated in our survey, but it, there, we were finding that the distinction between those was a bit fuzzy. And so we, it made sense to, to lump that together into into one category but you know that that's pretty much the the playing field here is you know private equity is doing you know 40 percent and family offices and high net worth is doing effectively the rest with just some alternative institutional money making up for a, a small slice
Okay, uh, and then the, the structure of the equity security. So this is pretty consistent with what we typically see in, in private equity. Um, interesting to note that you know it's it's not a foregone conclusion that the capital provider is going to get a preferred. Um, you know, it's it's pretty split between uh, common and preferred, um, and so uh, that I think generally ref is reflective of what we see in private equity. Great. So moving along to management fees. So, you know, we have what we call kind of the three pillars of the independent sponsor economic model. Uh, the first of those is the management fees. The second are the closing fees and the third and, you know, most importantly, probably is the carried interest. So we're going to move uh, piece by piece through those, through those three pillars. Uh, management fees, uh, you know, for those of you unfamiliar, this is a, an annual or more commonly a quarterly uh, fee paid by the portfolio company post-closing to the independent sponsor and potentially to the equity provider uh, for ongoing, uh, you know, private equity consulting expertise. Uh, it, it forms, you know, as, as, as many know, sort of the, the base case economics that the independent sponsor will receive uh, in all but sort of dire scenarios where perhaps the credit agreement uh, goes into default. And, and then we'll talk about what happens with respect to the management fee being, being shut off, uh, the promote being, uh, you know, the, the upside uh, economic piece. Uh, so diving into the data, um, you'll see that the, the EBITDA-based model is by far the most common. Uh, so, so the two ways to measure this are um, that, you know, the, the parties can agree to a straight dollar fee, call it 200000 and pay that um, annually, or more commonly, you look at the, uh, oper you know, the operating EBITDA of the business and measure that as a, as a percentage. Uh, there was a small number of uh, data points where instead of EBITDA-based, it was a revenue-based fee, but I think there were only three or four responses of that nature. So we're really just talking about EBITDA versus straight dollar amount. Um, there was a very small percentage where there was no, no management fee uh, at all. Uh, and, and this is talking about the management fees paid to independent sponsors here, to be clear. Um, so the next slide, this talks about what in the EBITDA-based model, what, is, what, you know, what are the management fees that we're seeing? Uh, pretty resounding data set uh, at, at 5% uh, being market. So uh, really, it, there are parts of the survey that are less clear. We'll talk about the carried interest. There's not um, a clear-cut market response, uh, but we do see 5% uh, EBITDA-based management fee uh, being, pretty, being pretty clear. And uh, Jeff, I may have stepped on your slide a little bit, but- uh, No, it's all right. Further? Yeah, no, this is definitely one of the most interesting slides, I think, in the, in the presentation, because it's, it's one of the core pieces of, you know, what is, what is market? Um, you know, that in 5% really resoundingly came across as, as the, the market and everything else is kind of widely dispersed. Uh, one thing that's not reflected on the slide is caps and floors. Um, and our, our data does dig into that. The survey dug into it and we have a lot of responses to, uh, to that. You know, we're gonna, we're, we'll elaborate on that in the, the fuller um, published piece. Um, but typically, you know, even if there's a 5% uh, management fee, it's very common to have a floor. Uh, so that way the, the independent sponsor knows that they're at least gonna get something, even if the, you know, if the, the company is, is puttering along and, and maybe not hitting the, an amount that's necessary for them to keep the lights on. Uh, and then usually a cap as well. So correspondingly, if the company is, is going gangbusters, there's some upper limit to how much money is going toward the management fee. Um, and so, as I said, we, you know, the published paper will have a little bit more detail on that, but wanted to flag that, you know, it doesn't mean 5%, like no matter how big the company gets. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's interesting because as you think about the three different pillars of the economic model, they're also inter interlinked and dependent upon one another that we've found with the caps and fours, 
it, it didn't really make sense to say this percent of deals had caps versus this percent of floors because you got to think, was there a cap and a floor? Was there just a cap? And so I think we'll have more to come on on that topic. Yeah, that's right. The data was a little bit, sometimes when the data got a little bit difficult to present in a, this type of format, we're, we're just punting to the larger, the larger presentation. Okay. Um, the, and this is the straight dollar. Uh, this is the straight dollar uh, management fee when it's not EBITDA based as we discussed before. EBITDA based is the most common model. Um, you know, you need to recall the deal sizes that we're predominantly working with here. You know, it, I think it was two thirds in the, the, the 10 to 50 million and then with, and then 75 or 80% under 75 million. And so when you have to, in your mind, kind of overlay that with this to help rationalize what that is, uh, you know, what these dollar amounts are relative to the deal size. Um, but you'll see, you know, basically 100 to 300 is, is, was by far the most common, uh, you know, two thirds of the deals in, in that, that space. So the, the next data point relates, you know, we just talked about the management fees to the independent sponsor. Then the next question as well, is the equity capital provider also taking similar management fees? And, you know, the, the data showed that the vast majority, there were no ongoing management pay, fees paid to the equity capital providers. And we think, you know, this is reflective of the value add that independent sponsors are bringing to the portfolios, uh, that, that they are the ones that are recognized with, with the ongoing management fee for their services. Um, this is one where if you were to dive into the data further, you would probably see some differences between whether private equity firms are going to want to take a management fee versus family offices, but in, in broad strokes, um, this this was the result. And, and again, we we thought it spoke to the the value of the independent sponsors. We uh, alluded to the concept of you know this this management fee is an important part of the investment and really only material items or, or, and events are gonna cause the management fee to stop being paid to the independent sponsor. One, uh, you know, one common interplay is with respect to the credit agreement and you know, what occurs if the company is no longer able to perform under the credit agreement. Uh, as you'll see, uh, you know, the most common result here, oh, sorry, one second. I meant to laser point here. You know, the, the most common result is one that is beneficial to the independent sponsor where uh, the payments pause. So it's not the most beneficial outcome for the independent sponsor. That would be uh, if the fees are not blocked, even if default. So we only saw that in 6% of the results. But the most common one is that the fees are blocked while there's an event of default. But during that time period, they accrue and there is not a cap on that accrual. Um, it is, uh, you know, the second most common result is that the fees are blocked and they accrue, but then there is a cap that is agreed uh, while, that, while that occurs. Yeah, and the logic behind that one is if the company's scuffling along and it can't pay the, the management fee, that there should be some upper limit on how much can accrue that is effectively diluting the rest of the equity. Um, before we, we say, uh, you know, uh, enough is enough, the dilution is, is enough and, and we're gonna apply a cap. Um, that, and, that's interesting data, for sure. Yeah, yeah, and the other interesting point is that in only 2% of the deals did the management agreement completely terminate upon an event of default under the credit agreement. So uh, again, it's, it's a very important part of the economic model for independent sponsors. It should pause and there should be negotiations about what happens with respect to that. But the, the termination result is, is not market, as you can see. Okay, so next up is the, 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 one of the other pillars here is the closing fee. And we're going to use the, the nomenclature here, closing fee. Uh, it's, it's kind of loaded from a regulatory perspective. Um, because of broker dealer regulations and most independent sponsors are not affiliated with the broker dealer. So I think this is one that is really important from the early stages 
when you are thinking about your LOI and what kind of language goes into it, that you are consulting an attorney and making sure that you're kind of putting the best face forward uh, as well as structuring things in a way, or at least understanding the risks that you're taking. Um, and uh, so I, I wanted to reiterate that. And then second is you know, there, are, there are, and maybe I take a step back. Everyone I think understands what a closing fee is. It's, you know, a fee paid at closing. Um, the, and it can be paid in, in cash or it can be paid in equity. And there's various uh, strategies that we can take around tax to try to minimize the, the tax that's paid uh, in the year that the closing fee is paid. Again, that one, you want to uh, consult with an attorney up front, I think, to help them. There's, there's a few different uh, answers that you can come up with. They've got different economic results, but uh, also different uh, um, kind of risk tolerances. Yes. And uh, you, know, you, you definitely need to understand some folks might advise on, on some approaches that have significant risk. And I think you want to, you really want to think about that and what is the right answer for you um, before you really structure your fee. Yeah, I, I would reiterate that. And, and I would say that we at McGuire Woods are aware of all the structures out there and can talk you through them and, and talk through the you know, potential risks involved. Um, with, yeah, with some of the structure. I mean, right. I mean, yeah, Greg and I were talking before this and they said, oh, do you know what, you know, X firm is out there, how, how they structure. And yes, we are aware of all the different ways <laughs> to do this uh, and can counsel you through them. If something sounds too good to be true, it often is. And there's usually risk to that. You know, the IRS wants their piece and there are permissible ways that we can try to uh, avoid paying them their, their piece in the first year. But, you know, there's, there are limits and uh, being mindful of those is important. Uh, so how's the, the closing fee percentage calculated? Um, you know, the vast majority uh, of deals here are, uh, they're calculated based on enterprise value. So an aggregate enterprise value of the deal. Um, so if the target's enterprise is, you know, if the value is 50 million, then the, the right uh, base value to calculate is 50 million. Um, you know, it's a pretty small number of deals that do other things. You know, 7% based on the, the capital raised, based on all capital raised, and then 10% based on the, the equity capital raised. Um, so I think definitively an enterprise value basis for the fee is market. So the next slide, uh, size of the closing fee. Um, I'll let everyone just kind of look at and digest the results, but you'll, you'll see the most common band here is between 1.5 up to 2.49 as far as a percentage of enterprise value for a closing fee. Uh, if you were to further dive into the data, uh, the 2% the results for deals from 10 million to 50 million, 2% uh, of enterprise value is the most common result that we saw, which is consistent with you know, the, what we see in our practice as well. Um, uh, you know, to w one item to note, I mean, as, as alluded to is uh, the decision of like, there is this closing fee that's going to be paid, uh, the decision of whether to roll all or a portion of that into the equity of the go forward company. Um, looking at the data, we found about 40% of independent sponsors rolled the entire closing fee uh, into the deal. Uh, and with the remainder rolling a portion or, or not. So the, the, next, the next slide is, is the flip side in a sense of, are there closing fees that are gonna be paid to the equity capital provider uh, as well? Uh, the data shows that in a majority of deals, there are no closing fees paid to uh, the equity capital provider. Um, this is another one where if, if you dive into the data and look at, you know, are private equity firms more likely to take the closing fee versus family offices? I, I think consistent with our practice, you would probably see that it skews to be more common that a, that a PE firm would, would take some fees. 
But uh, again, the, the majority of capital writers are not taking fees at the closing. Okay, so the next and, and, and final, one of the pillars of, of independent sponsor economics is carried interest. Um, so I, I think probably everyone in this room knows carried interest is the, the independent sponsor getting a share of the profits that otherwise would have been paid to the capital provider. Uh, this is typically reflected in an LLC waterfall uh, and it can be reflected either in the hold co waterfall for the enterprise or uh, also commonly, if there's a carry vehicle, uh, it will it will be instead in the in the carry vehicles waterfall. Um, so the, the money would get upstreamed and then split out uh, at at that stage. Um, Great, and and so here there's two basic models here. Um, there is a sort of more more simplified what we call the straight percentage model where after a, after a return of capital uh, to the equity investors, uh, then a certain one percentage is agreed upon and that is paid to the independent sponsor. Um, oftentimes it's not only a return of capital, uh, but also a preferred return uh, that is paid to the equity capital provider and then the straight percentage uh, kicks in. Uh, the other model is a, what we call variable with hurdles uh, where various you know, hurdles based on either MOIC or IRR are agreed upon. And uh, when, when each of those are hit, then an increasing percentage is paid to the independent sponsor. Um, as you see from the data, a, a fair amount of deals use this, the straight percentage model. I, I would say you know, in our practice at McGuire Woods, we probably see more than 61% using a variable with hurdles approach. Um, so our, our own experience may skew more common towards the hurdles. Uh, I, I think that there is simplicity to, this, to the straight percentage model. Um, it, it's kind of you know, potentially consistent with sort of the, the two and 20 uh, model that, that many may be familiar with. And so again, maybe with, with respect to larger club or syndicate deals, you might see that more often. Yeah, I think that's where I've seen it more often is when the, there's more investors investing a smaller amount of money and we just don't go down the road of doing something highly bespoke with the, with the hurdles. Right. So the, the next question, uh, when, you're in, when you're in the hurdle model, the next question is whether to use an, an MOIC or an IRR uh, standard. And so, you know, there are, there are pros and cons to each. I think that, um, you know, philosophically, capital providers are, are, are typically in one camp or the other. The, the MOIC is, is a pretty simple measure. It's really just cash invested uh, measured against cash returned. And it's, you know, either a, a 2X, a 3X, et cetera, is how it's, it's typically phrased. Uh, the, the internal rate of return, uh, as, as all the business people in this know, uh, you know is, is based on the, the time value of, of the investment and measured as a percentage over time. Um, you know, we, we don't see it as often. Uh, so you'll see that the data shows that MOIC is, is the predominant uh, system. And that is consistent with, with what, we, what I see, uh, MOIC. Um, again, IRR has its benefits. We, we don't see as much the, the hybrid approach, but you know, we, we definitely see the logic to it. Uh, when parties want to talk about an MOIC, for example, over the first five years, I think that makes a lot of sense as far as the return to your investors. But as you think about a 3x return over a, a nine-year hold period, that's not really that powerful of a return. So at times you'll see uh, maybe after five years, it flipped from MOIC to IRR. Uh, and there's, there's certainly logic to that. Uh, sometimes you also see uh, sort of a dual hurdle where, uh, you know, to achieve the first hurdle, you must achieve both, um, you know, a 2x return and an and IRR percentage as well. And you have to clear both of those before the independent sponsor achieves that hurdle. Uh, 
Um, so yeah, there, there's yeah. two ways to do that. You could either have kind of a base IRR that doesn't change. And it just says, you know, here's, you have to hit a base minimum IRR and then increasing MOIC hurdles. I've, I've seen that pretty commonly. Um, I think probably less common, but you do see it is the IRR hurdle will step up as well, as well as the MOIC. Um, and that, that one is, gets pretty tough sometimes for the, for the independent sponsor because he's got to clear both hurdles to get to the next, uh, to the next sharing percentage. I think we can flip that one. It's just a cover slide. Um, so how many hurdles are utilized? Um, you know, the mad scientist in me uh, often uses, I think, more hurdles than this or <laughs> gets uh, asked to. Uh, the, uh, but the, the most common answer is three hurdles, um, which is actually not that, uh, it's not that many hurdles really. That's, that's keeping it, I think, pretty simple. Um, and, but that was 42% of deals. And then you see, you know, a pretty meaningful amount still use two hurdles. So, um, you know, that, that the 12 step waterfalls that we see sometimes uh, that, you know, I think are, are less common and you're certainly less fun to draft. <laughs> so the, the first hurdle um, for an MOIC based promote. So, uh, you know, if you look at the data, 91% uh, are in those, those first three categories, the basically between one X and two X and the way that the, the, the cutoff works here, two X to 2.49, I'm guessing that the, the two X itself is, is almost entirely, uh, comprised of deals that were two X on the nose. And so, you know, I think that the answer is, you know, between one and two X is the, the very most common way to start your, uh, to start your hurdles. And then when you look at the data, um, it, it starts to get pretty bespoke after that. Um, but the most common way of doing this is after that first hurdle, then uh, every other hurdle is either a half turn of uh, EBITDA or, or, or sorry, a half turn of, of MOIC or a full turn of MOIC to get to the next hurdle. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, again, we, we have sort of a treasure trove of data here, and it, it was really a, a presentation challenge because, as, as you can guess, each, you know, each data set kind of speaks for itself as far as the first hurdle, second hurdle, but also at each hurdle, what is the percentage that's going to be paid to the independent sponsor? And we started thinking about almost 3D graphs plotting out 300 different data sets. And so um, I, I think, Jeff, that's a, that's a great summary of, of what we typically see. And, and we try to keep, keep things slimmed down and simplified for this, yeah. this presentation. One more point I'd add on this slide is that the, the end point for the, you know, the, what's the last hurdle, usually we were seeing some were you know, three, but no more than four was kind of what we would most commonly see. So we weren't seeing more than four uh, almost ever as, as being the, the, the t last hurdle to clear. Yeah. And then four X or three X in, in the MOIC based model. Right. 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 Yeah. It would be the, the most common sort of home run result. Okay, so carried interest distributions after the after the first hurdle. So this is just once you've hit your hurdle, what is the independent what is the independent sponsors? Uh, what is their percentage? Um, and so it, you know, forty five percent are in that that ten percent bucket, and then twenty three percent is in that that next fifteen percent bucket. So that's um, and only fifteen percent go straight to twenty. Um, and so really, it looks like you know, 10 to 15 at that first hurdle is, is the most common answer that, that we're seeing. And then um, where do we usually land as an endpoint? You know, usually between 20 and 30%. And that is based on, you know, there's a lot of factors into, you know, where do you end up? And the catch-ups, which Greg will talk about in a minute, is, is important in that as well as kind of where you start and what your percentages are in between. It's kind of, you have to look at the carry as a, as a, as a whole. Uh, and it, that's one of the challenges we, we saw and, you know, we had about 20 slides and ended up simplifying this pretty dramatically to fit into it in our presentation. 
Great. And, and as Jeff mentioned, a, a very important component is the catch up to the independent sponsor. And when we say catch up, what we mean is, let's say the parties have agreed that after a 3x return, the independent sponsor will share 25% in the economics. Um, so without a catch up, you would have to get to that, that 3x return. And only after that point in the waterfall would the independent sponsor share in 25% of the economics. What a catch up would do is say, okay, let's, once we reach 3x, then, um, you know, then payments to the capital providers stop and we give 100% in the full catch up example, 100% of the proceeds go to the independent sponsor until if you look at all of the proceeds distributed above the return of capital, all of those proceeds, the independent sponsor gets 25% in this example. Then once the independent sponsor is caught up, then, then the waterfall proceeds uh, 25, 75 in this example. And so, you know, as we were talking about this survey and thinking about it, this would be one where we would have expected to say, you know, this is a point that our independent sponsors really need to keep their eye on and focus on because it's, it's super important. And especially depending on where you end up in the waterfall and an exit event. But, uh, you know, the data shows that our, our independent sponsors are keeping their eye on the ball here and negotiating for this, this catch up and getting it in, in 73 percent of the deals. Uh, I, I do think it's still worth uh, raising and reiterating that it's something to uh, put in, into the model at the LOI stage that there will be a catch up. Um, you know, I'm not sure what uh, the 73% of deals, you know, how hard fought it was at the definitive document stage to get in the catch up. Whereas if, if you make it clear at the LOI stage, uh, again, the, the independent sponsors are having a lot of success uh, negotiating for and getting these. Yeah, I see a fair. I've seen a fair amount of LOIs that are silent on on catch up, and I I think you can't really meaningfully negotiate the the hurdles and the hurdle percentages without knowing whether there is a catch up. And so, making sure it's addressed squarely in the LOI and not just as a business understanding that's not reflected in the document, I think is really important. My preference in an LOI is to actually lay out the waterfall, um, so that way it's it's very clear. Yeah, and I'd say one other um, one other overlay that's important when negotiating the hurdles is uh, understanding at the LOI stage the type of uh, debt finance that you're going to be putting in place with respect to the the platform. I mean, a you know a two x or three x cash on cash return to your capital providers is is much different in an unlevered deal versus a deal with significant debt finance. And, and, and that's typically, um, you know, can be negotiated in sort of a sources and uses discussion with your, with your equity capital provider and the equity term sheet. Yeah. And one other, one other LOI point that, you know, and I think, I think regard that list slide got cut, the tax distribution slide. Right. Um, but one other point that's a common LOI point that slips through the cracks if you don't have counsel look at the LOI uh, is whether tax distributions are treated as advances on ordinary distributions. And do, so do you want to just talk about what tax distributions are just as a, just as a step back. Yeah. yeah. For anybody who doesn't understand in a, you know, an LLC uh, is taxed. The, the members are taxed based on an allocation of profit and loss. That is not based on how much actual cash you receive. And so you can get book profits and get a tax bill without uh, any cash to pay for that. That's you know, dry or phantom income as people typically refer to that. Um, and so a tax distribution usually will be done either quarterly or annually. And it'll say the delta between your tax bill and the cash you actually received, the company's going to make a payment to you. So that way you don't have that dryer phantom income and, and are uh, having to dig in your own pockets. And so there's, you know, whether you treat that as an advance on ordinary distributions does move the needle. And especially depending on how you, how the, the business is going to perform. Um, you know, if it's blocked with the C corp, then this isn't a big deal at all. It's not really meaningful. Um, but if the company is going to be profitable and it's going to require a lot of cash going out the door to pay taxes, that could move the needle. And, and you need, I think when you're thinking about where, what are the proper hurdle amounts, you need to think about both catch ups and the, the treatment of tax distributions to really understand and be able to model for yourself what these hurdles look like. Um, and it looked like in the data, it was pretty much a jump ball. There was not really a, a definitive answer to what is market there. 
Um, I, my advice to folks, you know, when people ask, you know, what's market is, you know, basically that I see it go both ways. And just for yourself, as you're, as you're negotiating those hurdles, you need to understand which way it's going to be so you can model it out for yourself and feel comfortable with what you're getting. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think the punchline is that tax distributions are very much a business point and, and not really a, you know, not so much a tax point, yeah. how, how tax distributions are counted in the waterfall. And, and again, you know, important if you have the, you know, your negotiation leverage is the strongest at the LOI stage, uh, it, it would behoove you to, to put that into the term sheet and make it clear whichever uh, approach you want to take. Okay, um, so I'll, I'll move quickly here through the IRR data. Again, so this is a, a smaller subset of the promote structures that we looked at, use the, the IRR structure. Um, I, I think there's, you know, there's a variety of colors here. Uh, the, the takeaway is that the, you know, the first hurdle, the most common result was, was definitely 10% uh, up to 14.9%, but probably 10% would be 10 to 12 would be, would be common there. Uh, and, and I think the other clear, uh, clear takeaway was that the, at the second hurdle, it would jump to 20 to 24.99 as the most common result. So again, if you're not in a, in a straight percentage based model, you're in a hurdle based model and you're in IRR, it typically does take you one additional hurdle before you get to the, get to the 20%. Um, for the third hurdle, the, the data was a little bit mixed and you know, you'll see some very, uh, you know, some outsized returns there, even as high as 30% to 34.99, but not, not meaningful enough to draw many conclusions about the final hurdle. Okay, and then, um, Again, the, the other model here is a straight percentage model. Uh, what are parties agreeing to in the straight percentage model where you're just looking at, okay, have I returned the capital uh, to my investors? And commonly, have I also given them a preferred return of, of let's call it 8%. And once those two conditions are satisfied, what is the return to the independent sponsor? What's the carried interest? And it was, it was pretty resounding. The, 20 to 24.99, I think that's most likely the, the answer would be 20%. And again, it's kind of consistent with that two and 20 model that, that you know, many investors may be historically familiar with, but you know, in the independent sponsor, as we, we just saw in the data, it's more of the five and 20 model, I guess you would say, 5% uh, of the data. Uh, okay. Sure. Uh, so next step, one more slide. Uh, next up is dead deal costs. So this is a, obviously a really important point to negotiate at the LOI stage. Um, in a majority of the deals surveyed, the capital providers were, coming, were, were covering some or all of the dead deal costs. Uh, I actually spent quite a bit of time cutting this data up myself uh, and looking at it from a few different angles because I, I thought this was, this was interesting. And it's you know, it's always a negotiated point up front, and I wanted to kind of understand the data. It definitely, with a con when a control private equity investor was involved, uh, I was seeing in the vast majority of times uh, the control private equity investor was committing to pay most of the time all of the deal fees it, uh, if the deal broke, uh, and then in the in the times when it wasn't all, it was generally the vast majority. Um, that's pretty consistent with our experience. Um, most of the time we are successful in getting, uh, an entire hundred percent or, or a vast majority of broken deal costs reimbursed, uh, by the capital provider. Uh, I personally view that as kind of table stakes to get exclusivity, because if you think about it, the, uh, independent sponsor is, in almost all cases going to have to give exclusivity to the capital provider and say, okay, we're, you know, we're going to be partners in this deal. Um, I'm not going to talk to other capital providers, but in return, you know, you have the capital, you have a, a committed fund and I don't. And if this breaks, I'm going to need you just like you would, if it were your own deal, I'm going to need you to step up and pay the fees. Um, and so I think that, that 
is was consistent with with our uh, experience. And then where we didn't see uh, the dead deal costs covered by the uh, capital providers, it, it tended to be in very small deals um, and or in deals with uh, a lot of capital providers. So the kind of more past the hat, uh, go to a you know several high net worth friends maybe that independent sponsor is often not asking his high net worth friends or you know his network to cover the dead deal costs he's he's absorbing them but you know that it's always risky right you, you know these deals are expensive and if you're going to ring up you know accounting costs and legal costs and uh, other advisors um, that it's, it's risky to, to bear to try to bear those costs yourself yeah, yeah. And I think that, that taking a step back, we did see kind of that, that theme running through a lot of the data. There were, there were sort of the, the more sophisticated independent sponsor deals with, with hurdles, uh, MOIC based, et cetera, broken deal cost um, covered all or a portion by the capital provider. And, and a lot of the sort of bells and whistles, for lack of a better word, that we're talking about. And then there were, there were a fair number of um, more straightforward, we'll, we'll call it deals that were um, kind of 10 plus equity uh, checks and kind of the, the simpler 20% model after return of capital. And so, you know, th there's no right or wrong answer there economically, uh, but, but you do see themes that, that, that are consistent with either type of those deals. And I think, you know, as Jeff noted, maybe more likely for an independent sponsor to, to bear some of the cost in the more, the more basic model. Yeah, and I would say that this is one reason, another further reason to get sophisticated counsel involved early because this is a binding provision in an otherwise non-binding term sheet generally. And you're going to want to make sure that it's drafted appropriately to protect yourself and your, your uh, service providers. Um, because if it's, you know, if it's on your honor, well, it's on your honor and that's not, that's not great. So I would say you know, get it in there, get it in there, draft it tight and um, try to push for it because I think it's important. Great. Um, so just a couple other data points that we surveyed. Um, we asked about board representation. Uh, so this is, you know, after the closing, the independent sponsor has done all the work to arrange the deal and then going forward, what's the independent sponsor's involvement in addition to the management agreement is uh, the independent sponsor going to sit on the board. Uh, and the, the most common answer here was to have either one seat or a minority of the board uh, in, in a sizable minority of the deals, the independent sponsor uh, control the board in, in the deals that we surveyed. So um, interesting, interesting results there. I think that the types of capital providers that are used influences which bucket here you're going to fit into. Some are just more control oriented and some are less control oriented. Uh, and then also if you've got, then the more uh, equity investors there are, the less claim anyone has to control the board because it's, they don't have the, that big slug, the majority or plurality that would give them the cloud to say, I'm going to take the board. And so in the absence of that, the obvious person to have control is the independent sponsor. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, th this is definitely a data point that is, that is, you know, deal by deal based. Um, it's based on the philosophy of both the independent sponsor and, and the capital writer. Um, no, you know, no, no right or wrong answer here. Uh, we, we see it very, um, the, the next and, uh, and final data point is, okay, once you've negotiated for those board seats, what, what if any events would cause the independent sponsor to lose that board seat and the uh, sizable majority of deals, there are no events where the independent sponsor loses the board seat. Um, the most common event where the independent sponsor would lose the board seat would be a termination of the management agreement. And uh, those, are, those are usually very uh, significant events that would cause that management agreement to terminate. Uh, uh, commonly, a, you know, a cause type of event uh, might, might cause the termination of that management agreement, uh, truly kind of a bad act. Uh, but again, 
in most cases, the independent sponsor is not losing the board seat. Yeah, when, I, when I've seen that, it's pretty negotiated, um, you know, obviously very important and, and pretty tightly drafted to a pretty defined set of really bad acts. You know, if you're in jail, you can't really manage a business. And, you know, it's those kinds <laughs> of things. It's really bad, really bad kind of things, not just, you know, he's not performing quite yeah. up to my standards, but he's doing a pretty good job. I mean, it's gotta be pretty bad stuff usually. Which are always the most fun points for us lawyers to negotiate it. Is it like a conviction of a felony or like actually in jail? And then you've got people going back and forth. So fun, fun stuff. Uh, great. So, so that actually, uh, that, wraps, that wraps us up. Sure. And there was one question I saw. Actually, two questions. One question was, you were speaking about the broker. Well, you have to form, uh, you have to form entities and they have to issue securities and you, you, uh, and you have to, uh, you're still taking a fee. So uh, the answer is yes. And I'm by no means am I a broker dealer expert. We have broker dealer experts within McGuire Woods who tell me the answers when, you know, we get hard broker dealer questions. Um, but yeah, you, if you're taking a closing based fee, you really need to, th to worry about, uh, both securities laws and broker dealer restrictions and consult counsel. And, it, you know, when you're consulting counsel, don't, don't go to someone who only does a little bit of this stuff. Like these are really hard questions, really hard issues. You'd want someone who deals with this kind of stuff all the time. No, there's two LOIs typically. There's typically the LOI between the independent sponsor and the target company, uh, and that provides for the MA terms. And then there is a, usually a second LOI between the independent sponsor and his capital provider. And that usually will describe the, the equity, governance, management fee, closing fee, et cetera, kind of terms. Yeah, I, I would note that, yeah, when we were speaking about the LOI here, we were um, predominantly talking about the, the term sheet between the independent sponsor and the capital provider. Uh, there are a lot of great uh, market surveys out there for the M&A transaction. The, the ABA does a great study every other year about what's market for private M&A deals. Um, so that, that has a similar presentation for those terms, like indemnification and things like that. So as you're thinking about that LOI, I mean, first talk to a lawyer that does these deals all the time, but also there are other good resources out there for that, that M&A LOI. Yeah. What's your most common structure for the, the partnership itself? Partner or LLC, how do you LLC typically. Um, I really only see partnerships when there's a lot of passive investors in a vehicle uh, where the independent sponsor can act as the, the general partner. Um, you know, an affiliate of the of the independent sponsor acts as the general partner to be more technically accurate. Um, but uh, usually. Uh, someone who's investing a meaningful amount of money and uh, who is in this space is going to expect to have some levers of, of control or voice. And the LP really is you know, merely something for them to get their economics, but not really have much in the way of a voice. The general partner is going to operate it. Yeah. And, and to piggyback on that, I, we do not commonly see um, like a C-Corp blocker uh, at, the, at the operating company level. That's, that's where it's usually a, a flow through structure of some sort. And, and Jeff alluded to it earlier, but a, a structure we do commonly see is um, two LLCs, taxes, partnerships, Delaware LLCs. One is sort of what we call, I, I always call the hold co. LLC, and that's going to be where the seller rollover component comes in and, and all the uh, blocking and tackling goes on in that LLC. And then there's a management separate one. As well. yeah, 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 yeah. And then, yeah, your, your management incentive plan. And then above that, um, above that LLC, there will be another Delaware LLC that we call Invesco uh, commonly. And so that's going to be where the independent sponsor holds equity interests together 
with the equity investors, but importantly, there's uh, that's where the mechanics for the carried interest are, are commonly or in that, that Invesco LLC so that your seller rollover, for example, isn't seeing all the sausage making that you're negotiating with your, with your equity provider. They're just down at sort of the, the rollover entity that we call hold cut. Yeah, it's, it's a little more complicated when you have two entities because you have to make the two LLC agreements work in, in sync for transfer restrictions and issuances and, and governance, et cetera. That like all that, all those decisions that happen at the, at the, the top level or, you know, need to flow down and any of the equity stuff that happens at the lower level needs to flow up. Um, and, but it does have the advantage of, of being more secret. You can, the rollover guys and the management guys don't see your, your Investco or carry co LLC agreement. And so you can, Kind of hide those economics away. It also usually will simplify the hold co waterfall because then you're not trying to layer up promote or carry an interest into that that hold co waterfall. I see a question there. How common is it that it's set in advance and for any follow on capital requirements that the initial capital require uh, carries the same response to economics as initial capital? I would say more common than not that uh, I, you know, if I'm, if I'm representing the independent sponsor, I typically want to try to get uh, something into the documents that says that the capital provider has to invest it with there's future equity that gets invested, that it has to be through the carry vehicle and subject to the carry. Um, there's, you get pushed back on that sometimes. And sometimes a uh, capital provider will try to also put in some level of investment that's immune from carry, either from the get-go or maybe after they've invested a certain amount, they'll try to say, you know, I'll put in 30 million subject to carry, let's say, and after that, and I'm just picking a number out of a hat and they'll say, but after that, my, you, you don't carry on any of that money or you don't, you only carry on a certain percentage of that money. So that, you know, that's all kind of just bespoke based on the deal though. And the, the type of capital provider. All right. Awesome job, guys. I want to keep us on pace. We're going to hit a networking break now. Obviously, feel free to come up and say hi to Jeff and Greg, but thanks, guys. Awesome work. Great. Great.